thanks a lot for, for coming. So this is the CPR webinar series on political economics that we jointly organized with Helios Herrera, Ronnie Raisin, and Sergei Guriev. And uh, so it's the first talk of, of this term. Um, and our um, illustrious uh, guest speaker is Edward Miguel from Berkeley. We're very happy to have uh, Ted with us today. And um, well, let's let's get started. We're going to have uh, three more talks this fall, and so we're we're again full, fully back. Okay, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Ted. All right. Thanks so much uh, for having me. It's great to be part of this uh, this series, even though we're across the ocean. Uh, I'll just apologize up front about my my voice. I've had a little bit of a cold. I was tested. It's not COVID, but. With my kids back in school, I got a cold this week, so uh, apologies if my voice sounds a little bit, uh, a little bit funny. Um, I'll be presenting work that's joint with um, several co-authors, Johannes Haushofer, Carlos Paramo, uh, Paul Niehaus, and Michael Walker. Um, and uh, yeah, my understanding is I'll present for an hour and then there'll be questions at the end, but if there's some burning uh, clarification, please, please go ahead. Uh, so I'll be talking about targeting uh, program targeting. This is something that's really important for the design of anti-poverty programs. The targeting of programs is often also a highly political issue or politically uh, controversial. Uh, the most typical um, uh, type of targeting that one sees in development, at least, is and also in rich countries, is targeting of programs towards the poor, those who are deprived those with low consumption or those who are you know, uh, undernourished. There's a very large literature on how best is sort of given that goal of identifying the, the deprived, there's a number of different uh, approaches to identifying those who should receive programs. There's very common, it's very common in real world programs to use proxy means tests. So basically some sort of simple proxies simple correlates of poverty are used to identify the poor. But there's been a lot of creative work and I've listed, for instance, the Hannah and Olkin, some of the Alitas papers here, using new and other methods, sometimes community rankings to, to figure out if the community can identify who is the most deprived, uh, ordeal mechanisms, as well as some new work, for instance, by Josh Blumenstock and co-authors, trying to use new data sources like mobile phone data to identify. Uh, the poor. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, this is a kind of, you know, very interesting sub literature and, you know, ties into this classic work in development about poverty measurement. So I've cited here the, the uh, Foster, Greer, and Thorback, Bessel, and Kambor, um, and, you know, just kind of core topic in, in development economics. Um, the question we're going to ask, though, is we're going to step back and, and wonder whether targeting the most deprived actually does have the greatest benefit. And we're going to think in terms of social welfare uh, here. So, for instance, are the poor or the most deprived, when they receive a program, are they typically those who have the largest treatment effects? Um, or is it the case, and, and there's many reasons to think they might, maybe they have the greatest to gain. So when you give them assistance, they can gain the most. But at the same time, it could be the case that the poorest of the poor lack the circumstances, inputs, or skills to take advantage of program assistance and turn it into good outcomes. Maybe the poorest of the poor uh, waste what they're given. Maybe they're not able to uh, combine it with the right human capital or training uh, to do something good with assistance. And, uh, I think the microfinance literature and the literature on asset drops really reinforces this point. So I've cited the kind of famous Demel et al. paper here and, and several others, Rachel Meager's work. Uh, in this literature, it's been shown that there are highly heterogeneous treatment effects of microfinance or asset transfers. Some people simply do much more with that capital than others. And I think we can all introspect and, and it makes sense that there would be you know, some heterogeneity here. So if this is the case, <clears throat> it may not be the case that the deprived gain the most. And in fact, maybe some who are not the poorest of the poor uh, gain the most from these, these programs. If that is the case, by how much more, and this is something we'll ask uh, towards the end of the paper here, by how much more must the social planner value the gains of the deprived uh, in order to continue targeting the poorest of the poor rather than 
some other subgroup that actually uh, has the greatest impact from the assistance. So there may be some fundamental trade-offs here between targeting the most impacted and the most deprived. And what we're gonna do today is try to identify these groups in a real world program and try to quantify this, uh, this trade-off. There are, you know, this is obviously targeting is a core political issue and, you know, we're focusing on the social planner. And so, you know, this is very much a political economy paper. There are other sets of political economy concerns around, for instance, targeting in order to maximize politicians' votes. And there's a whole literature on this that we're not gonna focus on as much uh, today. So just to, to flag that up front. All right, uh, so what we're gonna uh, do in particular is consider ca the case of cash transfers. Um, cash transfers are very widespread um, programs. They, they uh, you know, exist in, I think, over 100 uh, countries. Uh, and try to understand the impact of cash transfers on household outcomes. And now back to the, the sort of framing, initial framing, if the cash transfers are simply additive to whatever baseline value of household income or household consumption uh, we start with, then it would be natural that the poorest of the poor would gain the most just by diminishing marginal uh, utility. So again, under sort of the simplest view of the world, targeting the most deprived would actually generate the greatest uh, social benefit, um, but there may be reasons why this doesn't hold. It may be the case that rich and poor spend on different things, undertake different activities. And so depending on the outcome that the policymaker is interested in, um, giving assistance to the poorest of the poor or somebody else may yield larger social benefits. And again, back to the framing before, because of the presence of market failures, different biases, credit constraints, et cetera, uh, it may not be the case that the poorest of the poor uh, you know, do the most with cash transfers. Okay, so again, we're gonna get into this empirical question. Is there a trade-off between targeting based on deprivation, the most deprived, or targeting those who gain the most? So this is the big, big picture frame. We're gonna study this empirically with data from Kenya, uh, there's an RCT uh, that was carried out by the NGO Give Directly that provided cash transfers in rural Kenya uh, several years ago that we've already studied in some other work. And now we're applying this data to study this question of uh, targeting. Just to give you background on the Give Directly transfer, they target households based on a simple proxy means test. They try to target households that have a grass thatched roof. And those households receive very large lump sum unconditional cash transfers. They target something between 35 to 40 percent of the villages in uh, of the households in these these poor rural Kenyan uh, villages. So it's actually quite broad coverage for an anti-poverty program, and it's a large transfer. It's it's something like a thousand dollars in exchange rate terms, closer to two thousand dollars in uh, PPP terms. The one of the innovations of this study beyond the framing of impact versus deprivation is the, the use of particular uh, machine learning methods to best identify the households that are most likely to be deprived and are most likely to have the highest, uh, the largest treatment effect. So, you know, others, of course, have often used OLS or kind of standard regression methods to try to identify the poor. There's a long tradition of uh, of doing that, but we're gonna use what we argue are more appropriate methods uh, and really better methods in a couple of, of very specific ways, these machine learning tools um, to identify, again, the most impacted and the most uh, deprived. And in particular, in the sample that we look at, we're gonna be dividing the sample into the 50% that are you know, more or less deprived and the 50% that are predicted to have the largest or smallest impact, where again, we can estimate those impacts based on the experimental design of this RCT of cash transfers. So, um, you know, the, the existence of a, an experimental subsample is going to be absolutely critical to this, uh, this exercise. We're going to be combining uh, that RCT data with the machine learning tools um, to carry out this exercise. So in that sense, it's an innovative uh, study, I think, methodologically in combining some of these, uh, these methods. Okay. So that's the, the kind of big picture background. What I wanna do next is talk about the conceptual framework and the methods, and then we'll get into the results and ask this question, is there a trade-off or not between targeting the most deprived uh, and the most impacted? And how might that differ 
by the um, outcome metrics that we're interested in. How does that differ based on the utility function of the social planner? Uh, and it's gonna turn out that maybe some of the results are a bit different than, uh, certainly than we expected. Uh, okay, so the, the background conceptual uh, framework, imagine a kind of standard social welfare uh, function. Uh, there's a planner, they're interested in the outcomes of households or individuals I, and they're trying to figure out where to target treatment T across these different households I to maximize the following function that you see there, which is the sum of uh, you know, the, the utilities W of these different households I, and their outcomes are gonna be a function of um, this met metric Y. It could be income, it could be consumption, it could be food security, whatever outcome the, the, the planner is, is interested in. As usual, we'd assume that this utility function is concave. Uh, so you know, the, 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 the second derivative is negative. And uh, you know, one thing that we can do immediately is sort of bring in potential outcomes notation that everybody's familiar with from, from experimental designs and say, well, this yi, their, let's say their income or their consumption, yi is the sum of yi naught. Yi naught is their outcome if untreated, if they do not receive this program, plus, Delta sub i times ti, delta sub i is the gain in their outcome if they are treated uh, times the treatment indicator. Okay, so in other words, you know, y naught plus delta equals y1, that's the outcome if treated, y naught is the outcome uh, if not treated. So and you can immediately see in this just very simple formulation, the tension that exists for the social planner. On the one hand, because of the concavity of w, they will, you know, if, if treatment effects were the same for everybody, they would target assistance to the most deprived, those with the, the smallest why nots, because they're going to get the largest gain in W um, by targeting that group. At the same time, if there is heterogeneity in the delta sub I, they would, uh, you know, also uh, want to target those who are most impacted by the intervention, those who have the largest delta sub I. Um, now, so the, if delta you know, were homogeneous, they would target the worst off, but with, with heterogeneity and delta, they may not. And I think what you should start thinking about is, you know, what does the do joint distribution of y naught and delta look like? What do you think? What's your prior about how these are related? Uh, you know, again, y naught is, you know, if it's small, those are the most deprived. Are those the people who have the largest delta? Do they have the smallest delta? Is it kind of flat? So keep that in mind because we're gonna be presenting in several slides, um, the estimated joint distribution between these two quantities. And we're gonna to try to estimate what the slope is and what the relationship is between these two. Uh, okay, a, an issue that's often really faced by a, a planner, by a policymaker in practice is that why not and Delta are not for, for a particular household I are generally not observable in the population. So for one, uh, you know, there's counterfactuality, meaning we may only observe you if you, you know, we may only observe your why not or your why one. So how can we get a sense of, of both of these? Uh, in practice, it may be costly to measure or verify, uh, you know, what household outcomes are. So for a lot of reasons, it isn't possible, it hasn't been possible for governments to target very specifically based on these, uh, you know, th these quantities. But we're going to imagine that <laughs> the the policymaker can observe certain things. They can observe a vector of covariates x sub i that are, say, pretty simple to measure. And these are going to be, you know, sort of like the, the measures used in typical proxy means tests. Basic household demographics, maybe broad economic sector, broad asset ownership or household quality, the sorts of things that can be relatively easy, easily observed and that, uh, you know, are often collected in proxy means tests. So the, the policymaker can you know, observe those, plus they have access to an experimental subsample. So, you know, in our case, they have access to data from an RCT that's going to help them understand uh, these quantities. Okay, so, you know, we're going to enhance what the policymaker can usually observe with an experimental uh, subsample. And the policymaker is then, or the planner is going to use these data to select a rule an assignment rule to figure out who's gonna get the program, who's gonna be targeted with the program. 
um, subject to their budget constraints. So imagine they can target the program to you know, a fixed number of households. Where are they going to uh, you know, target the program? In our case, cash transfers. Uh, all right. Uh, so you know, the, the, the predictions that we're going to come up with, and I'll tell you how we're going to do that in a minute, um, are going to be predictions of why not given these Xs, given the observed covariates of a particular household and the predicted treatment effect of the program. So this is the delta hat given the Xs. Uh, and these are gonna be the quantities we're gonna aim to estimate with machine learning as I'll, as I'll talk about. Um, now in practice, it's very common for policymakers who do proxy means test uh, type approaches to create a predicted deprivation measure, the why not hat based on the Xs. Um, but it's been much less common to do so, to our knowledge, for the delta hat. That's really something that's, that, that hasn't been done empirically you know, nearly as much. Uh, so one of the, the goals of this paper is really to, to try to make explicit this trade-off, something that's, that's really salient in practice. There is an existing literature in econometrics, a really cool literature, the empirical welfare maximization literature, but it's been more focused on general general findings, uh, you know, sort of the, the, you know, trying to understand the general properties of, of estimators like those we're talking about, we're going to focus on a particular applied policy issue that's of great interest in development, um, but hasn't really been emphasized much to date. Okay, I see there's a few comments in the chat, and since I'm about 10 or 15 minutes in, let me just take a quick look at um, some of the comments now and see if I can kind of resolve a couple of them. Uh, the first one that comes up is by David McKenzie. Hey, David. Um, so David is, is talking about, he says, the framing is that policymakers only care about outcomes at one point in time. We may care about the present discounted value benefits. This is a great point. It's something that we've talked about a lot on the team, David. We're going to observe outcomes at sort of a particular time frame, and we're going to sort of focus our analysis on that time frame. But you're totally right that over different time frames, we may get quite different patterns. So thinking about cash transfers, maybe you know, in the week or two after the cash is delivered, we see certain consumption patterns, but a year or two later, uh, different households use that cash for different things. And that leads to different sort of you know, flows of income, you know, sustained flows of income. So um, we're gonna focus our measurement at one point in time when we observe the households, but you're totally right that in general, they would care about it at multiple points in time. And that would sort of, you know, be an extension of what, what we could do and, you know, a generalization. So thanks for raising that. We've discussed it. For now, we have our hands full estimating it at one point in time, but hopefully we can do more. Um, I see Ronnie has asked, what about spillovers from treated to their families if the poor tend to share? Yeah, so this is a, a you know, very important point. I'll mention some of our existing work on spillovers in this data. We do find that there, there are quite general spillovers from this cash transfer program in the local community. Uh, and I'll tell you in a minute sort of more about how we handle that. So thank you for that, that question. And then I see um, Alessandro uh, Tarozzi. Hey, Alessandro is asking about the standard error of the estimates in the different subgroups. And then, you know, do we deal with those standard errors or do we determine whose impacts are larger only based on the point estimates? So, you know, we are going to focus uh, on assignment to the most deprived or, or not uh, deprived in the machine learning tool across many different runs. So we, we do think there's sort of quite a bit of robustness to those assignments. We will be interested in the standard error uh, of the differences across these groups in a way I'll be very precise about later on. So we are able to do inference um, on the differences across groups. Uh, if that helps, it's not exactly your your point, but uh, we you know we will we will go beyond simple classification and try to get into to some inference uh, if that helps at all. All right, so thanks for those really good, uh, really good questions, and I'll definitely be hopefully getting a copy of the chat after the talk because these are these are great points I want to share with my with my co-authors. Uh, all right, so you know in terms of the targeting rules, we can kind of be a little more precise in terms of notation about what we're uh, hoping to do. And let me just go through the three sorts of targeting approaches we're going to focus on in the talk today. Um, the first one, <coughs> again, apologies for my cough, um, is targeting the most deprived. So imagine that we can classify households into those who have the smallest predicted why nots. And we're really focusing on the, those with 
you know, why not below some sort of threshold, depending on the budget that we have for the program. And you can see this is going to be, uh, you know, policy rule RD, focusing on the, the, you know, the most deprived. The second sort of rule is focusing on the most impacted, targeting assistance to those that the planner believes will have the largest, uh, you know, gain. So this is the rule RI. Here we want to target assistance to the households with the largest predicted delta hats, the largest predicted impacts uh, from the program. And again, if we have a fixed budget. Um, we'll target it to those above some, uh, you know, threshold level of, uh, of the Delta hat. Uh, you know, again, if we don't have much curvature in the W and so we don't really favor the poor much, um, you know, we would generally, the planner would want to target those with the largest impact under the kind of utilitarian social welfare function that we've posited. Uh, finally, there's what we call the balanced approach, which is R star. And this is the optimal targeting based on the social welfare function we laid out uh, before, where the, the planner may be balancing off targeting the most deprived and the most impacted, and the degree to which they target one group or the other uh, is, is going to depend on the curvature of W. So you can see the expression here. The planner basically wants to target those who have the largest gain in W uh, by being treated. That's how to, to sort of interpret the expression uh, there in brackets. Uh, and again, you, you, you need to think through in your head what the joint distribution would be of delta and why not in order to, um, uh, you know, come up with this group. All right. So these are just some of the, the kind of core concepts we're going to be uh, getting at. Hopefully they're pretty intuitive. Um, and now we'll, we'll try to, to, to be a bit more precise about what we do. So let me tell you a little bit about the setup in uh, rural Western Kenya. We're working in a pretty large sample in over 600 villages in Siaya County. There's about 100 households per, villages, per village and four to five members per household on average. So this is a pretty typical rural Kenyan setting. Um, the, the average respondent here is middle-aged. They have six years of schooling. Um, everybody in this area works in agriculture, but many people also have other jobs, self-employment, wage jobs. Again, very standard for a rural African uh, setting where people have multiple streams of of income, but it's a relatively poor area, and that's part of why it was targeted by, uh, by Give Directly. At the same time, the period that we study was one of steady economic growth nationally, about 3% per capita growth over this period. There were no national elections, no political instability, no pandemics. So, you know, it was a period of, you know, pretty stable, um, you know, economic growth. So I think that's just useful as a background. Uh, to keep, uh, to keep in mind. Um, we uh, worked with an NGO, Give Directly, that's pretty well known. They carry out these very large lump sum cash transfers to, to villages. And again, here they were aiming to target the bottom 35 to 40% of each village, targeting it to households that had a grass thatched roof. These, are gonna be, these households are gonna be our focus, these poor households uh, with a grass thatched roof. Now, of course, targeting 35 to 40% of the village is pretty inclusive. A lot of anti-poverty programs try to target an even more narrow kind of slice of the, uh, the population. Um, but, you know, again, we're not capturing the entire, uh, you know, the entire village. And so, you know, maybe there would be different impacts if we, if the program were targeted universally. That said, uh, you know, one thing that is interesting is if you look at the baseline distribution of things like income and assets, these 35 to 40% of households that end up getting targeted um, there's a lot of overlap in the distributions of those key outcomes between those who are targeted and those who are not, meaning some of the households with grass thatch roofs are still pretty well off, and some of the households that don't have grass thatch roofs are still pretty poor. Um, so, you know, we, we, you know, in terms of just the support of, of the distrib, you know, the, the support of uh, things like income and assets, um, the population that's program eligible is, re is, is relatively representative of these villages. Okay, so the way it works is the, the, the NGO comes in, they make sure everybody has access to, to mobile money and PESA, uh, and then they distribute these transfers over the course of eight months. And they're pretty large transfers, $1,000 not in nominal terms, about $1,800 in PPP uh, terms. So, you know, equivalent to a large share of annual household expenditure. These are really big, uh, big transfers. So something important to, to keep in mind. 
the program was designed in uh, a, as a two-level RCT. Not only were, were villages randomly assigned to treatment and control, but there was also a randomization at a higher geographic unit, a sublocation, where some sublocations were heavily saturated with cash transfers and others received very few cash transfers. And we take advantage of that uh, variation in existing work that I'll, I'll kind of mention briefly in a, in, in a few slides to estimate the spillovers of the program. So in some areas and some market areas, there were you know, lots of cash transfers and we can see what spillovers there were for the ineligible households, for the untreated households, for businesses in the area. Uh, and we tend to find quite large uh, spillovers. Um, but, uh, you know, but there's also the randomization at the village level and then some variation within the village between the eligible and the ineligible. So all that variation allows us to under understand spillovers. It was a large scale data collection effort. We censused all the households in the treatment and control villages to determine who was eligible, conducted end line, you know, baseline and end line uh, surveys. Again, here we're gonna focus on these eligible households because they were the ones that you know, could receive the cash transfers and were, were interested in, in the impacts among those households that were targeted. Um, so that, that, you know, that's the focus here. We do take advantage of the collection of the baseline variables and we'll focus here on a set of baseline variables that are very typical of what uh, is often used in proxy means tests. So things like household assets, demographics, basic employment sector uh, forever. So th you know, those are the, the kind of X sub I uh, vector. Uh, and we have a pretty large sample. So we have almost 5,000 households surveyed at baseline and end line among this, these eligible households, the ones with the grass thatched uh, roofs. Um, and you know, baseline's good for the, you know, for the X's, the end line allows us to measure why not and why one for the control and the treatment treated households. And this gets back to David's point, we typically observe them between nine to 31 months after the first transfer. Uh, so you know, again, a roughly a year and a half or two years you know, for most households after they get the transfer, we're gonna measure outcomes. So you know, there might be somewhat different outcomes if you measured households the day after they got the transfer or five years after they got the transfer. We're in this kind of middle, you know, medium run range. Um, so something important to keep in mind. Uh, and we had you know, a very high survey rate of around 90% balanced across treatment groups. So we feel good about the data quality here. So what are we gonna focus on? We're gonna focus on, and actually we pre-specified this algorithm. We pre-specified these outcomes. We wrote a pre-analysis plan, I should say that. So what we're presenting today very closely follows uh, that plan. We pre-specified four uh, outcomes that are commonly used as measures of welfare in existing programs, consumption expenditures, which are often thought of as the sort of, you know, gold standard of living standards measurement and development, household income, household assets, you know, wealth basically, and food security. So these are kind of four very typical outcomes that are used in anti-poverty programming or development programming. And we're gonna you know, find out what uh, this potential trade-off between deprivation and impact looks like for these outcomes and see if there's differences across them. You'll see that there are some, and that was one of the interesting uh, findings here. We're gonna define all outcomes at the household level. This is, we feel like the correct way to do things because the cash transfer in dollars was the same for small or large households. So we're gonna measure, you know, since it was the same number of dollars that went into the household, regardless of household size, we're then gonna measure things like income or assets or consumption for the whole household so that we're comparing dollars in to dollars out or shillings in to shillings out. Um, one of the nice things about this set of variables and part of the reason we, we collected them is um, they allow us to, to really make some progress in understanding what's going on in these households. So for instance, you know, if we find trade-offs in households where you know, some households gain a lot in sort of current consumption, uh, but uh, at the same time have fewer assets, if we find that those are sort of negatively correlated, it would suggest that you know, heterogeneity in households marginal propensity to consume is quite important. Some households consume, some households save, we may be able to pick that up. Um, at the same time, if we see that uh, you know, income consumption and assets all sort of move together, that households that gain in one of these dimensions gain in others, that would suggest that these are households that took the cash transfer and had quite a high return on investment uh, for the cash transfer. So you know, the households that got the cash transfers generate more income, that allows them both to consume more and save more. 
So I'm going to get to, 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 to these kinds of differences in a bit. I know I'm anticipating a little bit, but I just want to plant the seed in thinking through the economics uh, of this. You know, finally, food security is a, a very important objective. And you, know, you might think that this is one in which those who are most deprived are kind of especially likely to have high impact, uh, you know, impact of cash transfers, just because food consumption is such a core need. So the most deprived may take their marginal dollar and spend it on food. So we're gonna, we're gonna test that. All right, I see there's a few more comments in the chat. So let me pause again and see if I can um, you know, answer a couple of these. Um, so uh, Alessandro is making the point again about precision of the, uh, of the estimates. Um, and you, again, you make a very good point here, you know, Alessandro about, you know, again, large, are there groups that have large benefits, but are estimate, you know, where these are sort of imprecisely estimated, um, you know, uh, benefits to the extent that the, um, I, I, you know, the, the, the machine learning approach won't fully deal with this. Again, we're going to run, you know, many runs of the, of the, of the generalized random forest. So we're not really worried as much about outliers, but it is still the case that we could have groups with very large anticipated benefits that are, that are noisy. Uh, it's a good point. And, um, you know, I'll have to think through exactly how that, that figures into our, our estimation. But again, thanks for raising that. Um, Aditya raises the point, uh, having a fourth group, which assigns different weights to different subgroups uh, that could, might best mimic community-based targeting. Okay, so I'll have to think more about that one. Thanks for that, that comment. Um, Thomas Rosh is asking about uh, are there quid pro quo for these contributions? Um, what has no cost has no value. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly about that one, but maybe maybe that's one that I can think more about. Again, thanks for these these clarifications, and and these are going to be really useful for me to take to my uh, to my co-authors. Um, all right. So in existing work with this data, we have a, a paper, the Egger et al. paper, <coughs> where we report on the average treatment effects from the cash transfer program that I just described. And we find large significant cash transfer impacts on all of four of these outcome measures, it turns out. So on average, there were gains, you know, on average a couple years after the cash transfer was given out in terms of household expenditures, income, assets, and food security. So that's a kind of starting point. And as I mentioned before, we also find spillovers onto the untreated households. And in fact, in that first paper, one of the main focuses is trying to estimate the, the transfer multiplier, the multiplier of all that spending, we find this multiplier greater than two. So a pretty large uh, you know, multiplier. So something to, you know, to keep in mind. Another point I wanna mention is in, in that other work, we had pre-specified examining heterogeneity of impacts across some you know, core set of baseline covariates. Th you know, again, things like education, demographics, lots of the variables I said we're using in the proxy, you know, uh, uh, that are kind of proxy means test type uh, type variables, um, and we typically cannot reject homogeneity of impacts across those dimensions, across things like respondent education or, or um, number of children in the household, things like that. Partially, that's because we're sort of, you know, only moderately powered to do so there, but partially it's going to, you know, the, the, the method that one uses is also going to be important. So there we pre-specified running OLS regressions with interactions. Uh, in this paper today, in the targeting paper, using machine learning tools, it's, we're actually going to be better power to detect heterogeneity. And we are going to find some important heterogeneity across subgroups. So just want to, again, emphasize the importance of the method. Um, there's a kind of broader issue of how we deal with the fact that there are spillovers. Now, to the extent that the, you know, uh, the, the spillovers are additive to uh, household um, uh, outcomes, uh, you know, and under some other, you know, I think sort of moderate assumptions, um, the, the existence of those spillovers does not threaten the exercise that we're doing today. The spillovers would just be additive to, to what we're finding. But, you know, under sort of, uh, you know, more complicated functional forms, um, uh, it may be the case that the spillovers and the direct treatment effects, you know, interact. So, um, you know, for now, we're really um, focusing on assumptions that allow us to put the spillovers aside and just focus on the impacts of the recipients in this targeting exercise. 
Uh, but in future work, we hope to, to try to understand how the spillovers and uh, impacts on recipients um, interact. So let me just leave that there for now. We don't have much to say on, on these interactions yet. We're working on it. Um, but for the exercise I'll present today, we're going to kind of assume that they're, they're additively separable and we can um, kind of set them aside. Okay. So there's questions on that. You know, I'm, I'm happy to answer them in, in the, the Q&A in terms of what we're working on. All right, so let me tell you about the algorithm that we use in terms of machine learning. And then I wanna to get to the results in the last uh, you know, 25 minutes here. Uh, what we do here is we're sort of presenting the algorithm the way they might uh, sort of in a you know, machine learning uh, type exercise. So this is you know, algorithm one, we're trying to select the most deprived group and the most impacted group. We follow the kind of standard approach in machine learning and uh, you know, divide the data into folds. So K different folds. And we do estimation in one set of uh, you know, data, one subset of data, randomly chosen subset of data. That's the, you know, the training data. And then we apply the estimates from that data into the held out sample. And the reason why this is important and, and part of the reason why machine learning tools are so powerful is this helps to deal with overfitting. So you know, if we run our typical OLS regression on the full sample and we generate you know, predictions that we apply within that same sample, we're gonna have a tendency to overfit the data. Outliers are gonna be influential. Whereas if you use a training sample and then there's this held out sample where you apply the estimates, uh, you're gonna have much less uh, overfitting and outliers are gonna be less influential. So I think that's, that's pretty intuitive and one of the powerful tools here. So we're gonna create these predictions you know, across folds uh, for um, the most deprived uh, households. We're basically going to, you know, we have uh, estimates of why not, sort of outcomes for the untreated in the N-line data for the control group. That's the definition of why not. Uh, and we're going to uh, see how the baseline covariates X predict that outcome um, and assign a sort of you know, predicted deprivation to households in that way. And we're going to do something very similar with the predictions of delta. Again, we have the experimental data. We have the why not and why one. We can come up with estimates of treatment effects in different uh, you know, subgroups, individuals with different uh, sets of Xs. Um, and we'll do that in the training data and apply it to the, the held out sample. So again, you know, we deal with overfitting uh, because individual I's outcome never influences their own categorization into these groups. It's always determined by the, you know, in the training data. Okay, so that's, that's one of the kind of intuitions of machine learning. In particular, we're going to use generalized random forests. This is sort of work that Susan Athey and co-authors have done a lot to develop in the last five years, bringing them into kind of the mainstream of uh, econometrics. Uh, generalized random forests are, uh, you know, related to trees. If you're familiar with trees, you know, the way it works is a tree is trying to determine, uh, you know, which uh, splits in the data are most influential. They sort of, the tree is looking at data and figuring out if there's a certain covariate X, uh, do I sort of maximize variation across groups by splitting on X or not? Where, you know, maximizing variation means it's influential and it goes through and splits on all the different X's in the, uh, you know, covariate vector. But it does this, you know, many hundreds of times uh, through many hundreds of trees in a given forest where it randomizes the order of the X's, it splits in different ways. There's different subsamples of the data used in order to obtain robust inference um, in, the, in the overall forest, which is a kind of combination of these trees. So that's the kind of language uh, that's used. We're gonna carry out this exercise and we'll, I'll also mention later on how we benchmark it against OLS, which is more subject to you know, overfitting. We're gonna focus on 16 of these Proxy means tests like covariate X's that are you know, often used to target social programs. I'll, I'll give you, show you that list later on. Um, and we're gonna report the average of these machine learning estimates uh, across 150 different uh, forests. And again, each forest has up to you know, maybe thousands of trees within the forest. The reason we picked 150 is after about 100 forests, the estimates become very stable. So we go out to 150 and we get sort of like very stable um, you know, estimates. And so, you know, that was one of the, one of the goals here. We, we do what are called honest trees, which is sort of what I mentioned before, any categorization or split in the tree 
uh, is not determined by household eyes own observation. It's sort of determined in the training sample. Um, and, um, you know, so, so let me, let me keep uh, moving on. Um, one caveat on forest, just for people who are interested in machine learning and, you know, really just over the last year or two, I've, I've learned more of this, these tools. It's, it's obviously really, really interesting and important. Um, generalized random forests do not have optimal regularization rules the way something like lasso or ridge uh, do. Lasso or ridge have optimal regu regularization, optimal sort of penalty terms that you can come up with in order to minimize overfitting. But what one can do using generalized random forest is adjust the parameters um, of the estimation such that the estimates you obtain line up with the actual estimates. So in our case, we know what the average treatment effect is in certain subgroups because we have an experimental sample what we did here is we tuned the model such that those estimated effects, the deltas, the estimated baseline values, line up very closely with the predictions. Um, and that's the way we address overfitting. So this is a kind of typical approach using generalized random forests. All right, so that's a lot on, on machine learning. Let me just go to the chat and see if there are some uh, points here. I see there's a question from Erica. Um, about you know how much do we about are you planning to evaluate how much the spillovers might affect optimal targeting? Yes, we're we're working on that and hoping to say more on that. In the existing work, we estimate the size of those spillovers and they're pretty substantial. Under the assumption that those spillovers are homogeneous everywhere and they're additive, the approach I'm presenting today is totally valid. To the extent that there's more complicated interactions, we may have to adapt some of the, the findings in the targeting paper. Um, Muhammad is asking, how do we deal with outliers? Do you keep, do you eliminate them? Do you evaluate them separately? Um, so here again, uh, you know, the machine learning approach is actually good in dealing with outliers. They're going to be less influential um, in our predictions using the machine learning tools than they would with OLS. So that's one way that we can uh, deal with them. Uh, David McKenzie is asking, um, in practice, oh, this is a very long one, but probably really good one. Um, so I don't know if I have time to, to go through this whole one, but I'm definitely going to check this one out, David, uh, you know, after the talk. And maybe you can ask about it in the, in the Q&A. Um, Annie, um, OK, so Annie's saying, if you have 5,000 observations, you use 16 covariates. Is it sufficiently big data for the ML algorithm? There are studies showing that with not big enough data, random forest is good and even worse. OK, so this is a great point. Uh, that Annie is, is raising, maybe it's related to, to David's. Um, part of the reason we use the generalized random forest is it is um, quite good with limited, uh, limited samples. It is one of the advantages of this, uh, this approach. It's been shown to be quite robust, even with limited samples. Um, I will show you the comparison with OLS. You said, well, is it going to do better or worse than OLS? In, in a number of ways, the generalized random forest approach is going to do much better than OLS in a way that I'll make precise. So thanks for, for asking that question. All right, so let me just go quickly because I realize um, I have about 17, 18 minutes left until we open up to the, to the Q&A and I want to get to the results. These are really just, you know, the, 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 the kind of formal representations of what we're doing. We're going to take the average predictions. We're going to take the average actuals, you know, for why not in the control group. We're going to get the average treatment effects, conditional average treatment effects for subgroups of Xs, uh, and we're going to compare these. But, I, you know, there's nothing too complicated about these formulas, we're also able to do inference uh, using um, the randomization inference approach in, in DING at all. So, you know, we're going to actually be able to do inference and test for differences across these subgroups using uh, some, some approaches in the data science literature. All right, so let me give you, again, a, a little bit of simulated data, and then we'll get to the results. I want to just sort of um, set people's thinking about some of these, these trade-offs. This is simulated data. I'm going to talk about three cases conceptually, and then we'll look and see if we find them in practice. So again, let's think about the joint distribution between Y0 and delta. Y0 is deprivation, delta is impact. And you can see that in the figure here on the right. The x-axis will be predicted Y0, predicted deprivation. So as you move to the right, you get richer. And then the y-axis is the predicted delta. As you move up, you have a larger impact. This first case that we've put up here, case A, is one in which the most deprived on average tend to gain the most from the program. Those with the low, lowest why not 
tend to have the largest delta. So this is actually a case where there is no trade-off. If we're targeting the poor, not only does the planner like targeting the poor because they're the poorest given the concavity of the utility function, but they also gain the most, no trade-off if this is the case. But there are other cases that are possible. One is maybe the less deprived gain the most, that's case B here, the people with higher why not, the richer, somewhat richer people tend to gain the most. Here there is a hard trade-off. Now, if we target the poorest, we're not getting as much overall gain. Case C is a case where there's no clear relationship between, and we just made this up to kind of look pretty and say, well, there's no clear relationship between you know, a deprivation and impact. It's kind of a flat relationship, maybe it bounces around. So in this case, with a pretty homogeneous delta, the planner might again want to target the most deprived. All right, so these are just the conceptual cases uh, to put out there. And now we're going to actually try to estimate exactly these relationships. We go through the machine learning approach, get estimates of why not and delta hat, and we're going to plot them out and see which of these cases we're in in practice. Okay, before we get there, let me show you some of the, the core results, and I'll just explain this table a little bit. These are our predicted why nots in the sample for the four main outcomes. Panel A is consumption, panel B is income, panel C is assets, panel D is food security. Let me start with consumption, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the, other, the others here. What we have here is the predicted end line value for the group that's predicted to have the largest impact and the group that's predicted to be most deprived, these consumption values and the others were normalized. We sort of normalized across uh, seasons. So the mean is zero. Uh, so a positive value means the average is above the mean, a negative value means it's below the mean. What you can see here is the predicted consumption for the most deprived in dollar terms is way below the mean. So that's kind of good. That means the, the, the algorithm is, pick, is actually picking up people that are most deprived. And it's very close to the actual, which is, you know, so minus 542, minus 600. So again, because we have experimental subsample, we can always sort of check our predictions against the actual. And the most deprived are predicted to be poorer than average. The most impacted, the predicted value of the end line value for the most impact is about 100. The actual is about 40. There's a little bit of a gap there. You can see that these values are positive. So the data is already telling us that, for consumption at least, the most impacted group tends to be somewhat better off than average. All right. Uh, and I'll, we'll make this more formal uh, in a bit. There's a very large difference between these two. Now, if we look at something like income, we get a little bit of a different story. Again, the most deprived tend to be poorer than average in terms of income, and the predicted and the actuals are very close. But this is a case for income where the most impacted group actually has a mean very close to zero. And again, predicted and actual are, are very close here. The machine learning algorithm is doing quite well, but there doesn't seem to be, uh, it doesn't seem to be that the most impacted are much richer or poorer than average for income, this relationship would seem to be flatter. Okay, so we're already seeing between consumption and income something of a different story. Just for the interest of time, let me skip over panel C and D. This second table now shows predictions for delta, for impact. That, the, the one before was um, you know, the predicted uh, end line value, sort of deprivation. When we look at the deltas and we look at the most impacted group, we see the predicted impact of the cash transfer program in the most impacted group is about $345. The actual is about $400. So these are pretty, pretty close to each other. When we look at the predicted impact for the group that's predicted to be most deprived, it's smaller. It's about $250. Again, pretty close to the actual of 280. And you can see that there's a difference. The most deprived group has a smaller gain than the most impacted group. That difference is about $100. And when we do the randomization inference approach, we see that these are significant differences. So there is actually significant heterogeneity in the impact on consumption. The group that the machine learning algorithm uh, you know, finds to be most likely to be impacted, the I group, has a significantly larger gain than the group that's predicted to be most deprived. All right, so I just want to highlight that 
we are finding significant heterogeneity and the slope may not be exactly as we had anticipated. Now, if we go to income, the, the differences between these groups are smaller again. The, the, the difference between the I group and the D group is flatter again. And, and these differences, if you go to the randomization inference test, these differences are not significantly different. The p-value is 0 0.20 and 0 0.36. So again, the measure that we use is gonna actually be pretty important here. Let me briefly talk about food security. Food security is an interesting case. If you look at the predicted value of the treatment effect and the actual value of the treatment effect here, across the group that's most impacted and most deprived, they're almost identical. And the reason why, as I'll show you, is in the case of food security, there's tremendous overlap between these groups. The people who tend to be most deprived also gain the most, you know, in terms of meals eaten, nutritional security um, from assistance. So different outcomes in this table are already giving us very different results uh, in terms of who these most impacted and most deprived groups are. All right. So this is the, the kind of out, this is the main output from the machine learning approach, but we can visualize this. And I think it's most effective if I put this in figures. So let me show you these results, household by household. Each dot here is a household in the sample, um, showing the joint distribution of Y naught and Delta. Exactly this joint distribution I've been alluding to throughout. The X axis is Y naught hat, predicted end line value. So again, lower values mean you're more deprived. The y-axis is delta hat, predicted treatment effect. And what you can see here, if you look at the left panel, and this is in terms of the dollar values uh, for both the x and the y, um, for consumption is an upward sloping relationship. On average, the largest gains in consumption are not coming from the poorest households in this rural Kenyan sample. The households that are a little bit better off tend to gain more in terms of consumption a year and a half later when they get cash the poorest households gain less. It does look like there's a trade-off for this outcome. The right-hand panel is exactly the same data, but instead of putting it in dollar values, we're just doing it in terms of the CDFs from you know, zero to one, just the distribution. And again, you see the upward sloping relationship. We also created a heat map on the right. So you can see the density of observations and you can see there's just like a lot of mass in the bottom left. There's like a lot of poor households that don't gain much. And then quite a bit of mass in that upper right quadrant richer households that gain more, okay? So this is the, the, you know, the trade-off that we were kind of concerned about for consumption. Now I'm showing you these plots for all four outcomes. The top left is consumption. I just showed you that one. The top right is income. Remember, in the tables, it looked like the relationship was sort of flatter for income. And you can see it's really flat for income. Everybody is gaining in terms of income. There's this average gain of $60, $70 for the more or less deprived. Assets are similar. If we go to the bottom left, for assets, there's this sort of general gain in assets across the distribution of income, the why not distribution, um, without really much slope. Maybe it's slightly upward sloping, but much flatter than it was for consumption. So again, these different outcomes have different patterns. The bottom right is the result for food security index. Here we have a different pattern. Here, the most deprived are gaining the most. The people on the, you know, the, the left-hand side plot here have the largest deltas. And again, the reason it's sort of sensible, the, the, the poorest households that aren't eating that much, when they get cash, start eating more. That's like the first thing that they spend on. All right, so let me just pause for a second so people can kind of stare at these. You'll also see that we created color coding here depending on the quadrant you're in, you know, if you're sort of below zero, it means you're below mean deprivation. So you would be in the, in the deprived subgroup. And then, you know, above the mean gain means you're, you know, in the more impacted subgroup. So the, the color coding sort of captures that. I see a lot of pretty cool questions in the chat. Uh, let me just quickly look at that to see if there's something I can um, bring in. Yeah, so someone's asking a great question. Can you tell us what features the machine learning is picking up on? I'm going to show you that in like two slides. So what is the economics here? Um, and then Alessandro is saying, wouldn't you want to look at impacts on marginal utility? So that's, that's what we're, I'm going to show you sort of who's in this optimally chosen group again in a couple slides. So you guys are anticipating 
exactly. Uh, just most impacted, most deprived is too simple. We really want to take it, take it into account both. Um, how do you determine the size of the sample data for training? Muhammad is asking, well, we have our sample and we just split it into K folds. We split it into five folds actually. So that's, that's how we determine our sample. Um, Annie is asking an interesting question about the type and quality of goods these families consume. Here, we're just really gonna get a total consumption or kind of basic food security measures. We don't necessarily get a quality measures other than what they spend on. You know, if that's captured in spending, we would get it. Um, so, um, okay, so there's a bunch of other good questions. I can't go through uh, all of these. Oh, and then uh, Tobias is saying, do you have a hint of what types of commodities drive the consumption uh, increase? So there's really an across the board increase in consumption. So that's you know, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so again, uh, it isn't just one or the other uh, category. And Carlos is asking, does consumption exclude food? It actually includes food. So it's sort of total consumption and food is a big part of spending and for poor African households. Okay, thanks for all those, those questions. Uh, this is the same plot again, just in CDFs, but let me just skip over this. It's, it's really the same pattern, upward sloping for consumption, flatter for income and assets and downward sloping for food security. Okay, so what we're gonna do next now is I wanna talk about economic interpretation because this came, came through. And again, as I mentioned before, the kind of pattern here can let us know whether there's more variation and heterogeneity in preferences or opportunities. Um, you know, and, and, and kind of stepping back, there's some pretty interesting philosophical quest questions here related to some of Amartya Sen's, you know, work, you know, different people may have different ability to translate resources into better outcomes. And, you know, is it fair, I think maybe Sen's work would, would make us ask, is it fair to necessarily target those who are just better at doing things with, you know, the transfers? Is it better, is it, is it fair to target them? Is it fair to say, well, you generate more impact, so we're gonna target you. Within our social welfare function, that's what we're gonna optimize. We care about overall welfare. We care about overall income maybe, um, but I think there is a deeper ethical issue here. And so for instance, something that would be a very, you know, kind of poignant issue would be, what if it's the case that there's a group that's discriminated against in the labor market? You know, women or members of a minority group that don't have access to credit that don't have the same opportunities as other groups. So you give them cash and they can't quite translate it into you know, positive impact as much as the dominant group. Well, under our algorithm, we're still gonna maybe end up favoring that group that can do the most with the cash. Is that fair? We're gonna step back from those questions. We're gonna focus on the, the, the social welfare function as I've you know, um, formulated it. But I think it is worth thinking about as a kind of broader, broader question. It could also be the, the case, this relates a little bit to David's question on, on dynamics. Maybe if there is a disadvantaged group that doesn't, isn't able to do much with this assistance today, but there were a sustained program of assistance, maybe over time they would be able to um, you know, start overturning uh, social stratification and overcome the barriers that they face. So it could be that eventually they would gain more, whereas we're just looking over a couple of years. So I'm just throwing these, these questions out. We're not gonna be able to address them, but I think it's important to, to think about. Um, okay, and then let me get to a couple of other issues of uh, interpretation as well. How do these different treatment effects co-vary? I think it's worth asking. <clears throat> so on the sort of diagonal here, we have the distribution of the treatment effects for consumption, income, assets, and food security index. And you can see they're you know, somewhat skewed to the right, but not too abnormally kind of uh, you know, distributed. Then what we have here is the scatter plot of the relationship of the treatment effects of consumption with income. You can see they're very highly correlated. Consumption with assets, again, very highly correlated. And then consumption with the food security index, much less clearly correlated. And that comes through in the correlation coefficients, which we've put up here. So Income consumption and assets are very highly correlated. The treatment effects are very highly correlated. The same households that tend to be getting more income two years later also tend to have more assets and more consumption. So it doesn't look like there's a trade-off there at all. The correlations between food security and these other outcomes is much weaker. Only 0.04, minus 0.05, maybe a little bit more correlation with income. But you know, for the most part, food security is kind of its own thing. Whereas these other measures, 
the treatment effects are very highly correlated. So again, in terms of the world we live in, it looks like there's certain households that take the cash transfer and can generate more income, assets, and consumption out of them. The other question that came in is, what are the factors? What are the covariates that are driving these predictions? So this is a, a crazy table with lots of numbers. I'm not going to be able to go through all of it at all. And what we're doing here actually is doing what the machine learning algorithm spits out, which is the influence of these different variables. We've bolded for each column of the endline predictions and the predicted treatment effects for the four outcomes, we've bolded the three measures that are most influential of our proxy mean test type covariates. These are the Xs that we look at. And let me just highlight a couple of things. One very striking finding is large households tend to generate the largest predicted treatment effects across almost all outcomes. This is not mechanical. The large, the large households got the same transfer as everybody else, and their outcomes are measured in the same dollar units as everybody else. So this is a genuine treatment effect um, to keep in mind. Another one that's very influential, a demographic characteristic, is being a widow. Widows tend to be older. They tend to live in small households, very often alone. Being a widow is the strongest predictor of poor endline outcomes. So again, I think that's very intuitive, and it suggests the machine learning algorithm is generating results that, are, that make sense in terms of economic intuition. In terms of other outcomes, different employment and asset measures tend to be influential in predicting treatment effects in those dimensions. So for instance, those who had a lot of livestock at baseline tend to gain a lot in terms of assets at endline. So people who know how to manage livestock and assets tend to gain in assets when they get cash. Uh, and finally, food security predicts food security. So you, know, you can see that on the bottom right. So I think overall, the machine learning results coincide with our economic intuition uh, pretty closely. So I know I only have maybe 15 minutes left. We're going to open to questions. I'll ask Dominic, maybe since I've been taking a few questions, if I can just take three minutes to show you the welfare results and then open to questions. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, go ahead. Okay, that's great. So let me just uh, get into welfare and I'll close on that. <clears throat> so, you know, what we're going to do is impose a certain welfare function, CRRA, pretty typical. This is going to be the W function we talked about before. And we're going to say <clears throat> for different amounts of curvature of this function, would the planner <clears throat> prefer to target the most deprived or the most impacted? That's going to be the goal. And you can see the different sort of curvature here of different CRRA. If rho equals zero, that's linear. We weigh everybody's utility the same. We don't care whether you're rich or poor. We just care about delta. Uh, if rho is one, that's log utility. If rho is four, it's just incredibly curved. If rho is four, then if someone earns twice as much income, I value them at 116. So basically, I don't value them at all. Okay, so that's, the, that's what these parameters mean. And then let me sort of culminate with, <clears throat> with this table here. Let's start with consumption. What we have here is the overlap between the socially optimal households, the households that are going to be chosen by the planner to be targeted with this cash transfer program, and the most impacted group and the most deprived group, depending on the row. Row of zero, row of a half, all the way up to row of a four. You can see with consumption, when row equals zero and it's linear, the most impacted group is 100% of the socially optimal group. We don't care about curvature. We target assistance to those with the largest delta. And you can see there's not that much overlap with the most deprived. Not many of the most deprived are in this group for consumption. As row gets larger, there's fewer and fewer of the most impacted in the socially optimal group and more and more of the most deprived. But I think what's very cool here is we can show you the optimal, the, the row sub C here, above which the planner would, would target the most deprived. So in the case of consumption, it's 1.19. If there's somewhat more than log utility curvature, the planner here would rather target the most deprived rather than the most impacted. So our takeaway, and you can see for the other outcomes here, very often for a row of around one or a bit above one, again, we'd have this transition from targeting the most deprived, sorry, the most impacted to the most deprived. In other words, you would need quite a bit of curvature to target the most deprived. It isn't obvious that you'd target the most deprived. And the cutoff level here really just depends on the outcome that you would focus on. All right. So let me just wrap up there. There's a few more slides, uh, but I'll leave it there. And just this is the, the final slide. 
you know, the punchline is our goal was to try to clarify these trade-offs, to use some new methods. We have this large-scale experiment in Kenya. And the punchline is it may not be welfare optimal to always target the most deprived. It depends on the outcome you look at. It depends on the degree of curvature of the social welfare function. Um, and let me just leave it there and open it up for, uh, for questions. Th thanks so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, uh, really uh, fantastic work. Um, so yeah, if everybody could kind of um, uh, put their hand up button. Uh, so maybe while you are still uh, thinking about questions, I, I have one for Ted. Um, so, you know, the fact that, that you have um, this upward sloping um, uh, pattern for consumption, but the flat pattern for income, couldn't that be um, consistent with the notion that uh, the mostly priced people are indebted and the first thing they do is to pay back debt. So that means that they're, they're, they can in the very short run not do so much with the cash in terms of consumption because they first have to pay back debt. But then again, maybe consistent with what you were saying, if the program was rolled out for a longer time period, it would still kind of then translate into positive consumption as well, right? Yeah, it, it's a really interesting point that you raise. We do have some baseline measures of debt and we have, let me write that down. We haven't explored that uh, much, but we could do more with that. So thanks for raising that issue. We can explore if that's a key channel, uh, Dominic. So thanks for raising that. And on the point of the sort of sustained transfers, it's true. Maybe over time, we would see greater gains if there were these sustained transfers. So it's something that we, we can't study here as much, but, but I think is interesting. I see David's hand up and David, yes. you were active. I don't know if I can, can I call on David, Dominic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I let you maybe uh, select yourself the hands. That's most efficient. Isn't oh, good. Okay. okay. David, I want to hear your thoughts on this. No, so yeah, thanks, Ted. This was super cool. It's a, it's a paper I, I wanted to write, and I'm glad you've written it. Um, so, uh, you know, I have this discussion with policymakers a lot. So my, my point, I guess, uh, was, you know, in practice, of course, you're always going to have to do this for a, on a previous data set. Um, and then have to infer something about what's going to happen in a future program. And so, you know, when you do this fit and sample, you're getting the best possible case for doing this because it's the same time period, same, um, you know, setting, et cetera. And so, you know, I was wondering whether you could do something a little bit like uh, Natalia and, and Rushman and, and Ben did with uh, their paper on, you know, could you select, uh, um, winners where they took my Sri Lanka data and then they fitted their model on that and then they took that to India. You know, could you take one of like House Offer's previous give directly paper, fit everything on that, and then, you know, take this to your setting and see how well it does? Because yeah. my concern is I think that I think a lot, it's going to be a lot easier to predict who's going to be deprived in the future than yeah. the, these treatment effects that I that's my sense is that it's a lot more stable over time. And this gets at the sort of dynamics as well. You know, people who are poor today or, you know, chronically poor are going to be chronically poor tomorrow. But depending on the time frame you look at and the, you know, what's going on with the weather and everything, the treatment effects could vary a lot from um, time period to time period and from setting to setting. And so this gets to Alessandro's point about, you know, what can you predict, not yeah. just more precisely, but I guess, you know, what's more stable in terms of predictions. The, the people who have the largest treatment effect might be very different if you do it um, during COVID versus if you do it, do it during, oh, yeah. you know, a boom year versus if you do it yep. somewhere else. And I think for policy, that matters a lot. If we, if we think people, you know, have very um, uncorrelated treatment effects over time. It's a great question. Uh, it's certainly something we can do. We have, like you said, Johannes's other data. We've been doing some further follow-ups even in this sample that we could use in the future. Um, we've done something just kind of a half step in the direction of, you, of what you said. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't really carried it out. So I think it's a great point. Thanks. I, I've taken note of that. Thanks, for, thanks for, uh, for raising that. I think it's a good point. I do know that in some of the other machine learning applications predicting treatment effects, like some of Josh Blumenstock's work in Afghanistan, uh, they did find it hard to predict future treatment effects. I mean, I think you're, you're raising an important point. So thanks for that. Thanks for that point. Okay. Uh, are there any other hands? I see there's a bunch of stuff in the chat uh, as well. Like someone asked about 
looking at the different hyperparameters of the, the generalized random forest. I can get to that if folks are interested a little bit in the technical side. Um, and um, yeah, let me, let me answer that if there's no other hands up. I don't see any other hands, but um, we definitely did. Uh, and you almost have to with the generalized random forest work with the hyperparameters in order to get fit between the predictions and the actual because there is no optimal penalty term like with lasso. So you can vary the size of the leaves. <laughs> You can vary, uh, you know, the number of splits, and you know, there's different one things you can modify in order to get better prediction, you know, ac uh, alignment between predictions and actual. So this project took quite a bit of time because just learning these machine learning tools and going through that, uh, you know, I kind of went quickly over the methods, but that was like a year of work to to kind of get to work. And with this sort of data, when you're running literally millions of trees, it can just take days to do one run. For an outcome, so this has been we've had to get a lot of supercomputing power, and um, you know it's it's been a, a different kind of exercise than we're uh, we're we're used to doing. Um, John Luca asks a question I see in the chat about outcomes being measured: are they self-reported or objective? Um, these are survey reports. We're getting survey reports on consumption. We are doing a very detailed LSMS style consumption expenditure survey. So we are trying to do the best type of consumption measurement we can. Um, but yes, you're right that there could be measured for sure there's measurement error in consumption and income. And that's a well known problem in development economics that our income and consumption measures tend to be fairly noisy. So thanks for raising that. Yeah, that, that's a that's a fundamental, fundamental concern. Um, I'm scrolling up a couple of the other uh, points. Um, do people have an incentive to underreport their income or wealth? So it's a very good question. The way the NGO operated in this area was they announced that there was going to be a one-time transfer and that was it. And that's all that they've done in these particular um, areas. So if people believe the NGO, there wouldn't have been any reason to over-report, under-report or anything like that. Um, it's hard to get in people's minds. Maybe they kind of thought there were some reasons to under-report, but there were no uh, like obvious incentives to do so. The research team was also separate from Give Directly. We said we're separate from Give Directly. We're just measuring data. We said we weren't going to be sharing the data with Give Directly, uh, and we didn't. So that was another way to kind of insulate between the, you know, uh, the, the the implementers and the research, and and hopefully give confidence to the uh, to the respondents. Um, and then Asmita is asking, how do you plan to deal with or include the capability to earn or invest in your study? So, I, you know, we've, we were kind of rereading Sen, you know, in, in preparation for this a bit and, and thinking through his points. And I think, you know, th this notion that there is heterogeneity in, in, in capabilities, heterogeneity in, in people's ability to translate assistance to outcomes, to functionings, as he would call it, I think is really important. And, um, it just isn't something that's really in our social welfare function as, as we currently have it formulated, to be honest. So these notions that, yeah, maybe, you know, women are disadvantaged in society so they can do less with cash. And, you know, in our social welfare function approach, if, if women can't do much with the cash, that means their delta is small. We're going to be less likely to target them. We might actually think, again, that's more of a reason to target them because if we continue doing that, we can start breaking down these barriers. So there's a kind of like dynamic social welfare function that we're not writing down. That would be really interesting to think about. We can't study it directly with our data, but we're really sensitive to it. Because again, there's a fear that if we were to say we're gonna you know, target based on impact, we're just gonna reinforce existing discrimination or existing stratification. I think that's a big limitation of this approach. Again, we're just writing down the standard social welfare function, but. Um, we're sensitive to it. We think it's important and it's just a big caveat to, to this kind of activity. And maybe another reason why we should continue to target the most deprived, right? Like it would be a factor pushing towards targeting the most deprived that's not in our model, if that makes sense. So thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I guess I had one more kind of uh, caveat slide here, which I'll put up in case anyone wants to look at it. But I'm happy to, to take any other questions in the last last minute. I'll just make one last point on political economy, since this is a political economy seminar, which is 
one of the things we're not sure about, but would be kind of interesting, and people like David and, and others who work with policymakers may know about it is, could it be the case that if we really do use the best machine learning tools and the best covariates, and we could convince people we were targeting really accurately using these methods, this is the bottom bu bullet point here, could that build more political support for targeting and maybe mean that more resources are targeted in this kind of technocratic way rather than targeted for political considerations. I mean, I think that's something that's kind of lurking in the background. If we have good enough methods, we can convince people of, of the accuracy of targeting. Could we build sustainable political support for pro-poor targeting or pro-impact targeting instead of targeting the president's supporters? You know, that's something that, that, that's sort of lurking in the background that, you know, uh, may be a possibility. So uh, thanks so much, Ted, for the wonderful talk. Uh, great paper, great presentation. Mm -hmm.